Hey guys, thanks for tuning in. It's Tanner with Build Not Bot. Today I'm going to show you how I built this white oak table and bench combo. What's up guys, it's Tanner with Built Not Bot and we're about to jump in to another massive white oak project. If you haven't, check out the last white oak table I just built on YouTube. That thing was insane. This one isn't as long, but it wastes the amount of lumber, uh, mostly because of the base design. Thanks for tuning in and I hope you enjoy the build. It's milling time, so I'm gonna start by face jointing, then edge jointing every single one of these boards to get a perfect 90 degree angle. Once I have one corner at 90, I'm gonna take it over to my table saw and rip it so that it's the same width all the way down and then finish it in my planer. So I just pulled out my old combination blade and I'm replacing it with this blade that has 24 teeth instead of 40. Uh, note the rotation arrow here to tell you where to put it in correctly. The teeth should be pointing up and towards you when you put it down in on the arc. With any new blade or any blade that you currently have on your, your saw, it's always good to periodically check for square. And once everything's square, you can start ripping. This new blade is night and day different from my combination blade, and white oak is really tough stuff, so it's nice to have a sharp blade. Now I just gotta plane everything flat. Three hours later, I got everything milled for the top. The next part, and equally one of the most important parts in building quality furniture, is your board layout. And the ideal layout is going to differ from one person to the next. I personally love working with knots and lots of character, figure, the grain moving in and out throughout the boards. And around knots, it seems like you always get the most figure. I'm trying to cut out any sapwood. You see this lighter wood here on the edge of this board and stick to mostly heartwood, which is going to be more dense and darker in color. When working with your layout, you wanna make sure the grain on each board matches up similar to the next uh, board beside it. And I like to label everything one through seven in this case. And I also write it on the edge. Hey, tough, how you doing, buddy boy? Checking on my work. Uh, I like to label the edge because if you have to run something through the planer or sand it for whatever reason, that edge is always gonna be there and have your markings on it. And as always, I'm using the inside-outside method when I joint these so that I get a perfect uh, matchup for my glue up later on. So I just label inside-outside, inside-outside, all the way through every one of these boards so that when I take them to my jointer, I know if it says inside, I'm going to put it up against the fence so that it's facing the fence. And if it says outside, I'm gonna flip it and face away from the fence. And after jointing everything, this is what my tabletop is gonna look like. It's coming together really nicely. This is ready for dominoes and glue. Tomorrow, I'll be back in the shop and I'm gonna do uh, all of my dominoes. So I'm gonna punch a bunch of dominoes, probably five or six per board or per edge, and then glue it all up in my garage. It's way too cold out in my wood shop and outside to do any glue ups. The downfall to uh, my shop and not being able to heat it around the clock is I can't have any liquids out here in the winter or they freeze rock solid. So it's a little bit of a, a curveball that we deal with, but I'll just move all this stuff into my garage and glue it up there. Next, I go inside where it's a lot warmer than in the wood shop and I start to glue up the tabletop. Lately, I've been doing my glue ups in this vertical fashion. For some reason, it's been working a lot better for me, and I prefer to do it this way if I'm able to. It's nice to have gravity working with you versus against you. Off camera, I started to work on the table base, and I made a little bit of a glue up for that base, two pieces of white oak, uh, face jointed, and then glued together. Then I added this block to make a curve eventually, and I thought about this for a really long time. It was one of the most thought-provoking parts of this table how I could make this curve the easiest and the best. So if you have any ideas or if I should have done something different, please let me know in the comments. I am all ears. Now these legs were pretty rough out of the clamp, so I went and squared everything up and got everything the exact same height, which was 28 inches. Next, I made a small template out of some MDF to create this curve. I used a paint can to get that radius, which is about two and a half inches. I take it over to my bandsaw to hog out the majority of the waste material and then I get this double-sided carpet tape to fasten down my jig so it doesn't move anywhere. I started doing this about a year ago and surprisingly it holds really well. 
I'm then going to take the leg and this template over to my router table where I have a flush trim bit that's going to run on the template and then slowly work my way up the leg to create a nice smooth curve. All right, I'd be lying if I said that this next step doesn't scare the crap out of me, but I have a huge flush trim bit. And I'm going to use it to extend up from the current bit I'm using to get further up on these table base legs. With this monster bit, I worked my way up slowly through the heart of these legs, and then I finished them off with a different flush trim bit later on. And this bearing will run along this flat spide and trim up this last inch or so. This was from Freud. All right, so I just took a paint can and traced the radius here. I measured from corner to corner so that I have a similar radius. And these are only on the outside corners here. I made a mistake on the first radius. We're gonna go with this inner one. But essentially what I'm gonna do is cut a 45 across here, and then I'm gonna to have to hone in the rest of that with a plane. All right, guys, I'm starting to get really excited. Still so much work to do, especially sanding this inside radius on these legs, but you're kind of getting an idea of how it's gonna look. These edges, of course, are flat right now, right off of the saw, but I'm gonna get my Stanley number four out and round and contour these outer edges by hand. Let's get to work. All right, so remember I cut this 45 on these table legs here. It's a perfectly straight 45 corner. Now I'm making that corner nice and round, like this one here. So that's all been done just by hand with a, with a plane and then I'll have to perfect it with some sandpaper, but I'm really happy with, with that so far. Here's kind of the first look of what's going down here. After a successful glue up, it was time to do a little bit more work on the base of this table. I'm going to use threaded inserts for the felt pads that I use on this table to keep everything nice and level despite what the floor looks like. I always start with a large Forstner bit. This one is a three quarter inch bit. Then I follow that up with a half inch twist bit. And this is where I insert the actual uh, metal threaded insert. Uh, you just tap it in with a hammer. Sometimes it's nice to have a bolt handy to tap that in all the way. So I'm just using the head of a bolt and then that allows you to get in there and get everything nice and flat. While I had the bench or the base upside down, I figured I would drill holes to attach the top to the base. I often forget to do this until after I finish it. So I figured while I got it on the bench, I might as well do that. And I do these the exact same way to allow for seasonal change when they're fastened to the top. Up next, some shaping with my Japanese pole saw, a ton of sanding. Things were going so well, and then they went south drastically. Stupid, 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 stupid. Why do I always do this to myself? Oh, I'm so frustrated. All that work yesterday, basically out the window, and now I gotta figure out with a new plan on how the heck I'm gonna fix this. 
I think I'm just gonna walk away. It's Saturday morning. Uh, I need to run and get lumber for another project from Fargo. So I'm just gonna spend some time on the road thinking and hating myself. Ah, if any woodworkers are watching this or anybody that has an idea on how to sand this inside radius efficiently, let me know. I mean, the only thing I keep coming back to is just getting a sheet of sandpaper and by hand sitting there like this for five hours, but that might be what we got to do here. I have this inside radius, right? It goes the whole length of this base and it's roughed out, but it's nowhere near uh, finished sanding. So I, I bought these sanding discs for my uh, die grinder, but they just don't flex at all, unfortunately. And I gave it like a test run here, and you can see what happened. Ended up gouging this right here really bad. Didn't do anything that I was hoping it would do. So that plan is out the window. All right, four hours later and uh, walking up and down pretty much every aisle of Home Depot. Uh, this is going to be my next plan. I don't know if it'll work or not, but I bought this foam stuff that's used to insulate a, like water lines and stuff in your house. And my initial plan was to use that. And then I also bought a big thing of PVC pipe, like a four inch piece. That ended up being way too big. So scrap that plan. I found this piece laying around the house, uh, inch and a half pipe. And it just so happens to turn out that when I mix this with the foam pad together, it makes the absolute perfect radius for this inner edge. Now, with that being said, I don't know if this will work or not, but at least it's an option. And I was kind of out of option as to how I'm going to get this all smoothed out nice and smooth. So I bought a can of spray adhesive as well while I was there and a whole bunch of sandpaper, 80 through 150 grit. And my plan is to Spray adhesive this foam, hoping that the adhesive doesn't wreck or melt this foam. Stick sandpaper on here and use this to go back and forth. Keep your head out of the gutter and sand all that flush. I so I colored in everything with pencil, just like I would sanding something flat, I guess. And this will tell me what I'm sanding versus what I'm not sanding. And uh, here goes nothing. Well, this is awkward. So I'm vigorously stroking my sanding noodle, alternating arms because I'm getting tired really quick, but it does seem to be working. All right, after about a half hour with, this is actually 60 grit. I thought it was 80 grit, it's 60 grit. So pretty aggressive stuff. I've got almost all of my pencil marks removed. Um, the diameter of my patented uh, sanding noodle is slightly larger I'm finding out than this true radius which I'm okay with so I have a little bit of a dip on the bottom edge here but with my Rotex I'm not worried about that because I can flatten all this out all right I'm expanding my patent I've got 80 grit and then 120 grit here I've also uh, optimized the drag on it by cutting the uh, sanding noodle in half it's not about the size of the noodle right this one worked a lot better than trying to lug around that big dude. Well, I'm calling it a night. I'm really happy with this. Now that our base is really coming along, it's time to switch gears and focus on the bench to this table combination. And this bench is really special to me. It ended up turning out far better than I imagined and I've never built anything quite like it. But here I just have your basic white oak top. I added some threaded inserts so that I could attach this stretcher to it. Uh, I used a jigsaw to curve the edges of the stretcher so that from the side when you look at it, it kind of contours up and into the bench. I just thought it'd be a cool detail since the legs to this bench, which you're getting a sneak peek of them behind me right now, are also curved. 
So this stretcher was designed not really to support weight, but more so to offer me the ability to attach the top to the two cylinder bases. Speaking of those cylinder bases, let's get started on those. So this is way more geometry than I know how to do, but I was able to look up a couple different equations on what angle to cut for the certain diameter that I needed. This ended up being like 13.8 degrees on my saw. So I cut, I believe it was 13 or so of these slats that both had the bevel on each side of them. I'm adding a ton of glue to these. And then I used three pieces of blue tape to hold them together making sure the top and bottom are both flush. I slowly start to fold these on top of each other. Uh, I had to pause a little bit here and regroup, lift it up on its edge, and that blue tape held really well. It's the two inch stuff, so it had a little bit more surface area to stick to. And then I used the excess tape on the sides to kind of hold it in place while I could run and get a ratchet strap and put one on the top and the bottom, and I slowly started adding tension to this and it applies even pressure all the way around. I was getting good glue squeeze out. This turned out much better than I thought it would. And this guy over here, I'm about 75% done with. So when you look at it from the side, you'll still get those sharp inner angles but from the outside, which is all I really care about, it's really starting to become a sphere. And here's my proof of work, I guess, for the day. And I planed and planed and planed until I could barely lift my arms over my head, but we ended up with two cylinders. Here I'm just fine tuning everything with some 120 grit sandpaper. All right, I've got these all sanded up and I'm ready to figure out how I'm going to attach the actual bench stop. All right, so this might seem super goofy, but this is what my mind kept coming back to, and that was using a chalk line and going from midpoint to midpoint, measuring to make sure I had the same distance on each side and just adjusting these nails until everything was perfect, making a mark, and then going off of the width of that stretcher I made earlier, I was able to create what I'm going to call a mortise, and that top stretcher is going to sit down into each of these mortises. I've gotten my first look at how this bench is going to look. I still need to permanently attach the legs to the base and then I need to put the Rubio on it, but check this out. Everything was complete at this point. I sent some photos over to my client and we decided that the top should have had rounded corners on it instead of square. So I didn't catch this on film. I'm just using this Rockler corner radius jig. The two inch radius is the largest one I have. And I use double sided tape to hold this on and then use the flush trim bit to curve all of these edges. Now you'll notice this is a sharp edge versus a round over edge. So I have a little bit of work uh, contouring and shaping all these, but at least I've got a rough corner on all of these. Check out these beauty shots. It was so worth the extra effort to cut those corners and curve everything. I think it just matches the base so much better versus having the squared off edges on the tabletop. Thanks a ton for watching you guys. I'm super proud of how this white oak table turned out. Let me know in the comments what you think about it. And I'd greatly appreciate you liking and subscribing to my channel. Kai and I will give you a thumbs up. See you on the next film.